On today's story session, a tale about love, cannibalism, and vengeance. This is The Juniper Tree. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions, the podcast about how brutally dark and totally insane folk tales and fairy tales used to be. Which, in my opinion, just made them way better and more entertaining. So I've got the most true to the original version of Grimace Fairy Tales that I could find, and we're going through it front to back, story by story. We'll figure out the difference between the intended lessons of each story and the actual lessons of each story. And at the end of each episode, I'll adapt the tale into a movie or a TV show. Let's get right to it with today's tale titled The Juniper Tree. We begin. All this took place a long time ago, most likely some 2,000 years ago. All right, playing it pretty loose with the time period here, guys. There was a rich man who had a beautiful and pious wife, and they loved each other very much. Though they didn't have any children, they longed to have some. Day and night the wife prayed for a child, but still none came, and everything remained the same. Now in the front of the house there was a yard, and in the yard stood a juniper tree. One day during winter the wife was under the tree peeling an apple, and as she was peeling it she cut her finger, and her blood dripped onto the snow. Oh, said the wife, and she heaved a great sigh. While she looked at the blood before her, she became quite sad. If only I had a child as red as blood and as white as snow. Okay, what? The fuck does that mean? You want a child that's a swirling blend of bright red and bleached white? I mean, I guess it doesn't matter what the kid looks like, she'll love it, but... It's a weird place to go when you see blood on snow. This woman's desire for a child is making her insane. Upon saying that, her mood changed. And she became very cheerful, for she felt something might come of it. Then she went home. After a month, the snow vanished. After two months, everything turned green. After three months, the flowers sprouted from the ground. After four months, all the trees in the woods grew more solid, and the green branches became intertwined. The birds began to sing, and their song resounded throughout the forest as the blossoms fell from the trees. Soon the fifth month passed, and when the wife stood under the juniper tree, it smelled so sweetly that her heart leapt for joy. Indeed, she was so overcome by joy that she fell down on her knees. When the sixth month had passed, the fruit was large and firm, and she was quite still. In the seventh month, she picked the juniper berries and ate them so avidly that she became sad and sick. Uh, Okay. Lady, calm down a bit. You're eating berries so aggressively that it's making you depressed and sick. This is clearly a very unstable woman. After the eighth month passed, she called her husband to her and wept. If I die, she said, bury me under the juniper tree. Oh god, this woman is having such a hard time. Husband is probably just watching with grave concern as his wife just has this downward spiral while becoming obsessed with this tree. It's like, I know you want a baby, but you gotta stop eating the berries. Honey, eating berries until you're sick is not helping. After that, she was quite content, okay, and relieved until the ninth month had passed. Then she had a child as white as snow and as red as blood. When she saw the baby, she was so delighted That she died. Oh my god, this poor woman. She finally got the one thing she was going insane over, and it made her so happy that she just instantly fucking died. It would have been better if she'd cared a little less about this. That way maybe she would have survived long enough to actually enjoy having this child. Because I'm guessing that giving birth, the giving birth part, wasn't the reason she wanted a kid. Nobody's like... I don't really want to raise a kid and all the love and joy that comes with seeing a child grow. I just really want to give birth. 
You know, the incredibly painful and stressful experience of that. The painful part. That's all I want. Also, was she pregnant? It never said she was pregnant. So did this baby just just pop out of her one day? Because if so, it was probably the surprise that killed her, not the joy. It says she had the baby. It doesn't say the baby just showed up under the juniper tree or something. That would have actually made a little more sense. Damn, well... All right, she had this super crazy intense nine months just ping-ponging back and forth between joy and sorrow. She had this red and white baby and died immediately after having the baby. All right, we continue. Her husband buried her under the juniper tree, and he began weeping a great deal. After some time, he felt much better, but he still wept every now and then. Eventually, he stopped. Okay. And after more time passed, he took another wife. With his second wife, he had a daughter, while the child from the first wife was a little boy, who was as red as blood and as white as snow. What does that mean, exactly? I'm having trouble picturing this kid. So is the skin, like, swirling with bright red and paper white? I I mean, I guess. I'd I'd love a little more detail to to paint a picture here. Guys, whenever the woman looked at her daughter, she felt great love for her. But whenever she looked at the little boy, her heart was cut to the quick. She couldn't forget that he would always stand in her way and prevent her daughter from inheriting everything, which was what the woman had in mind. Gradually, the devil took hold of her and influenced her feelings toward the boy until she became quite cruel toward him. She pushed him from one place to the next, slapped him here and cuffed him there, so that the poor child lived in constant fear. My god, when he came home from school, he found no peace at all. This is terrible. I'm guessing life is already hard enough for a little boy whose skin is bright red and white. Now we've got this bitch of a stepmother being terrible to him. I mean, come on, lady. One day, the woman went up to her room and her little daughter followed her and said, Mother, give me an apple. Yes, my child, said the woman, and she gave her a beautiful apple from the chest that had a large heavy lid with a big sharp iron lock. Mother, said the little daughter, shouldn't brother get one too? The woman was irritated by that remark, but she said, Yes, as soon as he comes home from school. And when she looked out from the window and saw him coming, The devil took possession of her, and she snatched the apple away from her daughter. You shan't have one before your brother, she said, and threw the apple into the chest and shut it. Meanwhile, the little boy came through the door, and the devil compelled her to be friendly to him and say, Would you like to have an apple, my son? Yet she gave him a fierce look. All right, be careful, little guy. Mother, said the little boy, how ferocious you look. Yes, give me an apple. Buddy, come on. Then she felt compelled to coax him. Come over here, she said as she lifted the lid. Take out an apple for yourself. And as the little boy leaned over the chest, the devil prompted her, and crash! She slammed the lid so hard that his head flew off and fell among the apples. My God. God, here we fucking go, guys. Damn, that is brutal. <laughs> I, I got I don't like this whole thing about the devil prompting her and taking hold of her. Nah, fuck that. She's doing this stuff. Don't blame the devil for her shitty behavior. Fuck, alright, so this poor little red and white boy's head is now in this chest full of apples. Then she was struck by fear and thought... How am I going to get out of this? She went up to her room and straight to her dresser, where she took out a white handkerchief from her drawer. She put the boy's head back on his neck and tied the neckerchief around it so nothing could be seen. Then she set him on a chair in front of the door and put the apple in his hand. Oh god, this story has gone so far off the fucking rails, and I love it. Sometime later, little Marlene, I guess this is the daughter, came into the kitchen and went up to her mother. 
who was standing by the fire in front of a pot of hot water, which she was constantly stirring. Why is she just stirring hot water? That should be suspicious just on its own. Mother, said Marlene, brother is sitting by the door and looks very pale. He's got an apple in his hand, and I asked him to give me the apple, but he didn't answer, and I became very scared. Go back to him, said the mother, and if he doesn't answer you, give him a box on the ear. Oh, come, that's how you're going to play this, lady? Not only did you decapitate your stepson, but now you're going to traumatize your daughter and make her think she did it? Even for a cruel parent like this, it's crazy to tell one of your kids, if your sibling won't give you something, hit him. Oh no, all right, here we go. Little Marlene returned to him and said, Brother, give me the apple. But he wouldn't respond. Can't blame him for that. So she gave him a box on the ear, and his head fell off. The little girl was so frightened that she began to cry and howl. Then she ran to her mother and said, Oh, mother, I've knocked my brother's head off. And she wept and wept and couldn't be comforted. Marlene, said the mother, what have you done? You're not to open your mouth about this. We don't want anyone to know, and besides, there's nothing we can do about it now. So we'll make a stew out of him. <sighs> sure, that's the logical next step here. The mother took the little boy and chopped him into pieces. Next, she put them into a pot and let them stew. But Marlene stood nearby and wept until all her tears fell into the pot, so it didn't need any salt. Okay, I suppose they saved some salt money on this silver lining there, I guess. I'm sure the writer thought that that was a nice line, though. When the father came home, he sat down at the table and asked, Where's my son? The mother served a huge portion of the stewed meat, and Marlene wept and couldn't stop. Where's my son? The father asked again. Oh, said the mother, he's gone off into the country to visit his mother's great uncle. He intends to stay there a while. What's he going to do there? He didn't even say goodbye to me. Well, he wanted to go very badly and asked me if he could stay there six weeks. They'll take good care of him. Oh, that makes me sad, said the man. It's not right. He should have said goodbye to me. Then he began to eat and said, Marlene, what are you crying for? Your brother will come back soon. Without pausing, he said, Oh, wife, the food tastes great. Give me some more. The more he ate, the more he wanted. Give me some more, he said. I'm not going to share this with you. Somehow I feel as if it were all mine. Ugh. As he ate and ate, he threw the bones under the table until he was all done. Wait, the meat was still on the bone? Well, he should definitely be able to tell that it was a human, then. Human bones are pretty distinct, especially when they're all piled together like this. Come on, man. Meanwhile, Marlene went to her dresser and took out her best silk neckerchief from the bottom drawer, gathered all the bones from beneath the table, tied them up in her silk kerchief, and carried them outside the door. There she wept bitter tears and laid the bones beneath the juniper tree. What did the dad think when he saw that? Wouldn't he be like, man, Marlene is acting real weird about the animal with human bones that we ate for dinner. Well, whatever, off to do my nightly reading. As she put them there, she suddenly felt relieved and stopped crying. Now the juniper tree began to move. The branches separated and came together again as though they were clapping their hands in joy. At the same time, smoke came out of the tree, and in the middle of the smoke there was a flame that seemed to be humming. Then a beautiful bird flew out of the fire and began singing magnificently. He soared high in the air, and after he vanished, the juniper tree was as it was before. Yet the silk kerchief was gone. Marlene was very happy and gay, it was as if her brother were still alive, and she went merrily back into the house, sat down at the table, and ate. Did she eat her brother, or did she just like have some bread? Didn't want to didn't get involved in the stew. Meanwhile, the bird flew away, 
landed on the roof of a goldsmith's house and began to sing. My mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me, my sister, Marlene, she made sure to see. My bones were gathered secretly, bound nicely in silk as neat as can be, and laid beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a lovely bird I am. The goldsmith was sitting in his workshop making a golden chain. When he heard the bird singing on his roof, he thought the song was very beautiful. That's it? He just thought the song was beautiful? He didn't think it odd that the bird was singing human words? Or have a reaction to the actual words that were being sung? Some fucked up lyrics right there. Then he stood up, and as he walked across the threshold, he lost a slipper. Still, he kept on going, right into the middle of the street with only one sock and a slipper on. He was also wearing his apron, and in one of his hands he held the golden chain. In the other, his tongs. The sun was shining brightly on the street as he walked, and then he stopped to get a look at the bird. Bird, he said, how beautifully you sing. Sing me that song again. No, said the bird, I never sing twice for nothing. Give me the golden chain, and I'll sing it for you again. All right, said the goldsmith, here's the golden chain. Now sing the song again. The bird swooped down, grasped the golden chain in his right claw, went up to the goldsmith, and began singing. My mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me, my sister Marlene, she made sure to see. My bones were gathered secretly, bound nicely in silk, as neat as can be, and laid beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a lovely bird I am. Then the bird flew off to a shoemaker, landed on his roof, and sang. My mother, she killed me, my father, he ate me, my sister Marlene, she made sure to see. My bones were gathered secretly. They always repeat... The song. They don't just say, like, he sang the song again. We gotta go through every line of this song. Bow nicely in silk, as neat as can be, and laid beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet. What a lovely bird I am. When the shoemaker heard the song, he ran to the door in his shirt sleeves and looked up at the roof, keeping his hand over his eyes to protect them from the bright sun. Bird, he said. How beautifully you sing. Then he called into the house. Wife, come out here a second. There's a bird up there. Just look. How beautifully he sings. Then he called his daughter and her children, and the journeymen, apprentices, and maid. They all came running out on, into the street and looked at the bird and saw how beautiful he was. He had bright red and green feathers. I don't know why they just didn't give him bright red and white feathers, like the red and white kid. And then his neck appeared to glisten like pure gold, while his eyes sparkled in his head like stars. Bird, said the shoemaker, now sing me that song again. No, said the bird, I never sing twice for nothing. You'll have to give me a present. Wife, said the man, go into the shop. There's a pair of red shoes on the top shelf. Get them for me. His wife went and fetched the shoes. There, said the man, now sing the song again. The bird swooped down, grasped the shoes in his left claw, flew back up on the roof and sang... My mother, she killed me. All right, I'm just going to skip to the end of the song. When the bird finished the song, he flew away. He had the chain in his right claw and the shoes in his left, and he flew far away to a mill. The mill went clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. The miller had twenty men sitting in the mill, and they were hewing a stone. Their chisels went click-clack, click-clack, click-clack. And the mill kept going, clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. All right, we really get what the mill sounds like, guys. The bird swooped down and landed on a linden tree outside the mill and sang, My mother, she killed me. Then one of the men stopped working. My father, he ate me. Then two more stopped and listened. My sister Marlene, she made sure to see. Then four more stopped. My bones were gathered secretly, bound nicely in silk as neat as can be. Now only eight kept chiseling, and laid beneath, now only five, the juniper tree. Now only one. Guess that last guy is the, the toughest customer, not, not really a fan of music. Tweet tweet, what a lovely bird I am. Then the last one also stopped and listened to the final words. Bird, how beautifully you sing. Let me hear that too. Sing your song again for me. No, said the bird. I never sing twice for nothing. Give me the millstone, and I'll sing the song again. I would if I could, he said. 
but the millstone doesn't belong to me alone. If he sings again, said the others, he can have it. Don't they need the millstone to do their work? Don't give away your livelihood for a single song, especially a song you've already heard. All right, well, the bird swooped down and all 20 of the miller's men took some wooden beams to lift the stone. Heave ho, heave ho, heave ho. Then the bird stuck his neck through the hole, put the stone on like a collar, flew back to the tree. Oh my god, this is a strong bird. Sounds like he's more powerful as a bird than he was as a human. Took 20 men to lift this stone, and he's like, nah, I got it. My mother, she killed me. My father, he ate me. All right, I'm already sick of this song. I'm, I'm not going through it again. After the bird had finished the song, he spread his wings, and in his right claw, he had the chain. In his left, the shoes, and around his neck, the millstone. Then he flew away to his father's house. And I'm sure right after he flew away, all of the mill workers realized their error in judgment in giving away the millstone to a fucking bird. The father, mother, and Marlene were sitting at the table in the parlor, and the father said, Oh, how happy I am. I just feel so wonderful. Not me, said the mother. I feel scared, as if a storm were about to erupt. Meanwhile, Marlene just sat there and kept weeping. What the fuck? This is a crazy scene they're setting here. I mean, personally, I don't know how the dad can feel so happy when his wife is terrified and his daughter is crying in a corner. I mean, you're, so you're a sociopath if everyone around you being so miserable doesn't affect you and you can still just be, oh man, I feel great. In any event, we continue. Then the bird flew up, and when he landed on the roof, the father said, Oh, I'm in such good spirits, the sun's shining so brightly outside, and I feel as though I were going to see an old friend again. Not me, said his wife. I'm so frightened that my teeth are chattering. I feel as if fire were running through my veins. Is this just guilt? Why is she... Why does she feel this ominous presence? Is she picking up on the sun's presence? Or is she just now racked with guilt and is constantly like this? She tore open her bodice while Marlene sat in a corner and kept weeping. Man, now she's so terrified that she's tearing off her clothes. And still, I'm sure none of this is dampening the father's spirits in any way. He's just having a great old time. She had her handkerchief in front of her eyes and wept until it was completely soaked with her tears. The bird swooped down on the juniper tree, where he perched on a branch and began to sing. My mother, she killed me. The mother stopped her ears, shut her eyes, and tried not to see or hear anything, but there was a roaring in her ears like a turbulent storm, and her eyes burned and flashed like lightning. My father, he ate me. Oh, mother, said the man. And he refers to his wife as mother. Creepy. Listen to that beautiful bird singing so gloriously. The sun's so warm, and it smells like cinnamon. <laughs> All right. My sister Marlene made sure to see. Then Marlene laid her head on her knees and wept and wept. But the man said, I'm going outside. I must see the bird close up. Oh, don't go, cried the wife. I feel as if the whole house were shaking and about to go up in flames. Nevertheless, the man went out and looked at the bird. My bones were gathered secretly, bound nicely in silk as neat as can be, and laid beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a lovely bird I am. After ending his song, the bird dropped the golden chain, and it fell around the man's neck just right so that it fit him perfectly. Then he went inside and said, Look how lovely that bird is. He gave me this beautiful golden chain, and he's just as beautiful as well. Chaos. This is utter chaos. Also, did he not hear the words of the song? Why does he have no reaction to that at all? I mean, the song literally names the sister Marlene. Marlene didn't really react to either. She just kept weeping. This is, this is a random bird showing up and singing a song about what just happened. You'd think she would be a little more interested in this, but no, just chaos. But the woman was petrified and fell to the floor. Her cap slipped off her head and the bird sang again. My mother, she killed me, 
And the woman said, Oh, I wish I were a thousand feet beneath the earth so I wouldn't have to hear this. My father, he ate me. Then the woman fell down again as if she were dead. My sister Marlene, she made sure to see. Oh, said Marlene, I want to go outside too and see if the bird will give me something. Then she went out. My bones were gathered secretly, bound nicely in silk as neat as can be. All at once the bird threw her the shoes and laid them beneath the juniper tree. Tweet, tweet, what a lovely bird I am. Marlene felt cheerful and happy. She put on the new red shoes and danced and skipped back into the house. Oh, she said, I was so sad when I went out, and now I feel so cheerful. That certainly is a splendid bird. He gave me a pair of red shoes as a gift. Not me, said the wife, who jumped, and her hair flared up like red-hot flames. Hmm. I feel as if the world were coming to an end. Maybe I'd feel better if I went outside. As she went out the door, crash. The bird threw the millstone down on her head, and she was crushed to death. The father and Marlene heard the crash and went outside. Smoke, flames, and fire were rising from the spot, and when it was over, the little brother was standing there. He took his father and Marlene by the hand, and all three were very happy. Then they went into the house, sat down at the table, and ate. The end. They just ate? Who would have an appetite after this? Damn, that, that is an elaborate plan. I, I kind of like it, to be honest. He's got nice stuff to give the dad and Marlene. And the second the stepmother steps outside, boom. Crushed by a fucking giant rock. The weird part is that none of them seemed to have any reaction to the lyrics of the song. Nobody did, really. Clearly it's about them, though. And at the very least, Marlene and the stepmother should know this is related to the dead son in some way. But no, they just react as though it's a normal bird tweeting up a storm out there. And the dad is just, just totally oblivious this entire fucking story, to be honest. Presumably he saw his son and was just like, oh, you're back from your uncle's place. Great. Hey, did you see your stepmother? She went out the door a second ago, but now there's just a rock in front of the door and she's gone. Anyway, let's go eat. She's probably just going for a walk. Hey, where'd that bird go? Did you see that bird, son? It was, it was a great bird. It was like the best bird I ever seen. This dad is totally clueless the entire story. At no point did he catch on to anything. The bones, his crying daughter, the lyrics of the fucking song that literally say, my father ate me, his wife freaking out and tearing off her clothes. I mean, hell man, like pay attention to what's going on around you a little bit. This guy is just an idiot. I bet the son didn't even bother explaining what happened when he came back. It's just like, forget it. It's fine now. Mom's gone. We're all fine. I hope Marlene paid attention to the lyrics of the song, because otherwise she would still think she's the one who killed the boy when she hit him on the head for not giving her an apple. Hope this little boy clears that up ASAP so she doesn't feel guilty anymore. And everyone moves on real fast after the mother is killed. No one seems bothered by that at all. Even Marlene moves on super quick, and she thinks she's the one that killed the boy, so she doesn't know her mom is evil. That, that would really fuck with her. Her mom was just killed. But no, her and the father just seem totally fine. Well, let's go have some food. It's also kind of weird that the only character that got a name in the story was Marlene. And that didn't really prove necessary at all. The song would have worked fine without her name in it. Still, good for you, Marlene. I wonder how popular the name Marlene was 2,000 years ago when this story quote-unquote most likely happened. Man, this is, this is a crazy one. I love it. I couldn't help but notice the method of killing the stepmom, though. Millstone falling on her. This is exactly how Herr Korbs was killed in the story session a few weeks ago. He was killed by a falling millstone, too. Granted, in his case, it was a sentient millstone that came to his house to attack him alongside a bunch of other animals and sentient inanimate objects. Man, there are some weirdly specific things that happen in these stories. People being killed by falling millstone. Was that like a was that a threat back in olden times? 
Were people getting killed by millstones a lot? It doesn't seem super likely. But hey, these stories are starting to make me very wary of millstones and mills in general. Thankfully, I don't encounter mills or millstones very often in my everyday life. And that's a good thing, too. Because as far as I'm concerned, spending time around a millstone is, is just as dangerous as spending time around a hungry bear. That millstone is just waiting for an opportunity to attack. Keep an eye on your millstones, folks. All right, so that's lesson number one. Stay the fuck away from millstones. Millstones are a scourge on our society and a danger to all of our lives. I think the intended lesson is probably like the enduring power of love, that kind of thing. The mother's love for her child, giving that child a power of sorts. He can turn into a bird when when he's killed. Then the sister's love, the way she lovingly buried his bones by the juniper tree. It all seems to have a have a magical, empowering effect, this, this, this love that he was shown. I think that another lesson is that people will support beautiful and noble endeavors, honorable endeavors. The people that hear the song and react so strongly to it that they give the bird these things, which ultimately help the bird triumph, that supports that lesson. So there's something about the ability of, of people to rally together and help one another achieve great things. And in this instance, great things is revenge against his killer and his own rebirth. So there's something there about this this poor boy at his lowest. Well, I mean, literally dead and buried. That's as, as low a point as you can get. And then he goes and creates this song, this rallying cry, and people come and help. And ultimately, he is able to return home better and stronger and triumph over the evil that killed him. I, do, I like the lesson here about, about rebirth from someone's lowest point. Some other lessons, don't be cruel to kids, just like ever. Kids fuck up, sure, sometimes, but they're kids. Give them a break. This lady hates this kid because he's in the way of her daughter inheriting shit. Don't be crazy and take any of your own bullshit out on children. That is awful. And if you do do that, then that's when karma kicks into action and drops a fucking millstone on your head. So be nice to people, damn it. Especially children who have done nothing wrong. This kid's mom already died in childbirth. I can't imagine how painful living with that knowledge is. Don't pile onto that with your own cruelty and bullshit, lady. It's horrible. All right. All right. Let's adapt this thing. So I'm picturing a series like like on HBO or something, and it'll take place in Viking times. We've got a married couple who are farmers with a farm on the water. And they're very much in love, but having a hard time conceiving. And the couple will be played by Alexander Skarsgård and Alicia Vikander. And one day she finds out that she's pregnant and they are overjoyed, but she dies in childbirth and the father is heartbroken and he buries her on the hillside overlooking their humble farm. And then the father raises the boy and teaches him to fish and to hunt at a very young age. And one year, when going to the nearest town, the father takes him to a seer, and who tells him that, that he will live many lives, and only when he dies will he truly live. He tells this to the boy, and he's very little and, and doesn't understand, but the words they stay with him. And on that same trip, the father meets a woman, a, a renowned shield maiden, a female warrior from a very powerful family who has a young daughter and... and they hit it off, and this woman will be played by, by Numi Rapis. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Rapis, Rapas. So they carry on, and Numi and her daughter go back to live with Alexander Skarsgård and his son on their farm. And Numi thinks the husband is, is capable of way more, and that the time he's spending teaching his son different things and raising him well is just being wasted. And instead, he should be going on more raids with the raiding parties. And Numi's daughter and the son, they get along really well, and the daughter knows her mother is cruel, and so she tries to be extra nice, extra nice to the son, and, and they're good friends. And so eventually, Numi convinces Alexander to, to go on the raids one summer, and he leaves. Even though she's a shield maiden and would normally go raid too, she decides to stay home and, and look after the farm, but, but really she has ulterior motives. And while he's gone, Numi attacks the son, tries to kill him, and she hits him over the head, wounding him and, and thinking she killed him, and drags him to the woods and leaves him to be devoured by animals so, so there's no evidence. Destroy the body. 
and the daughter sees all this and is horrified, but she can't stop it because she's too young and mother is very powerful, and then has no choice but to accept it. However, Numi doesn't know that the tree that she left the body by is actually the same tree where his mother was buried. So that night the boy wakes up to find himself very wounded and a wolf licking his wounds. It's unclear if if the boy actually died and the, and the tree gave him new life through the magic of his, his mother's love, or if he was just wounded and on, on the verge of death. But he's surprised by, by the wolf, but the wolf does not attack him. He just, just licks the wounds and then curls up beside him and falls asleep. And the next day, he's able to stand and, and essentially just has to go off into the woods because he has nowhere else to go and knows Numi will find him and kill him if she knows that he's still alive. And the town is weeks away by foot. They got there by horse before, so he has to live in the woods, essentially. And he realizes that the wolf is following him and thinks the wolf must have must have somehow lost its pack and is all alone. And the wolf drags a dead rabbit over to him and he's able to start a fire and cook it and they both eat. And his father taught him well, so he knows how to survive. And he's a young teenager at this point, so he is able to get by with scavenging wild plants as, as well as what the wolf hunts. And so he's wandering through the forest and the countryside, and he wanders across a blacksmith who lives in the hills, who at first is very wary of this boy with, with the wolf in tow. But he sees his wounds, and he offers to have him stay with him for a while if he'll help him with some of the tasks around the, around the blacksmith shop. And the boy does this, and after a while, the boy tells him the truth of what happened to him. And the blacksmith says he can't do anything himself, because, because Numi is from such a powerful family, but he will give him the best hatchet and sword he can make as a gift. And he gives him this wonderful axe and a beautiful sword, and the boy sets out again. And he can now hunt with a hatchet and build things with a hatchet, and then he comes across a woman who makes shoes. She makes leather and leather armor as well. And the same thing happens. She takes him in, he helps her with her work, she asks, and he ultimately tells her his story. And while she can't do anything because Numi's family is so powerful, she makes him a pair of sturdy boots and flexible leather armor, and he goes off once more with his wolf companion. Then he comes across another farm, run by a very old but well-known warrior, who, who lives there with his many sons. And this old man is played by Ian McShane. And he's very intrigued by this, this young man with the wolf at his side, and he takes the boy in, and after hearing his story, he decides that he'll train him alongside his own young sons, the ones that aren't currently out raiding. So he trains him, and after two full years of tireless training, during which time the boy is essentially kept secret from the larger community by, the, by this old man and his family, the boy says, I must go. And the man says, are you sure? Because he knows that the boy wants to take revenge. So Ian McShane says, you could simply live here with us, just put your pain and your past behind you, and just live as my own son. And the boy considers this, and indeed, part of him wants this, but he can't stop thinking of his own father, who he loves dearly and who he knows loves him, and he knows Numi is deceiving and lying to him, like she always did even before she attacked him, and he knows she's still mean to her own daughter as well, and he decides he must go back home and, and make things right. And the old man says, says Numi is, is one of the most renowned shield maidens in all the land, and even with all the years of training in the world, it might not be possible for him to best her in a fight. But the young man says, I must go anyway, I must fight for my father and my stepsister, and so he sets off with the wolf at his side. And then he comes back home to find Numi with her daughter in the field outside the house. And the father, Alexander Skarsgård, he isn't there, and Numi, knowing that she'll be found out by the father if she doesn't do something, walks calmly to her house, retrieves her sword and shield, and walks across the field toward the boy. And the daughter cries for her not to fight him, but Numi tells her to shut up, go inside. But the girl doesn't. She just she stays there and she watches as Numi and the boy stare each other down for a moment across the field. And Numi says, You know I can't let you come back. And the boy says, I know. And then she says, is this going to be a fair fight, or are you going to sick that wolf on me? And he says, nope, this is between you and me. And after a moment of silent tension, Numi runs at him and attacks, and they have a long fight. Numi cuts his cheek with a swing of her sword. He splinters her shield, and she throws it aside and egging him on. She strikes his sword and causes it to fall out of his hand, 
and he draws the hatchet from his side and fights on, finally dodging a blow and plunging the hatchet into her back. And as he does, he hears a call and looks up to see his father jumping up from a boat, and he's stunned to see his son, who immediately tells him what happened, and the daughter backs him and says it's all true, and the father is devastated to learn this, but, but he embraces his son, and then just like the original story, they go inside and eat. And that's the show. In the next season, we could explore what happens with Numi's powerful family, who would probably be super pissed off about Numi dying, so that's the conflict going forward. There we go. We did a dramatic adaptation this week. Sometimes those those feel more appropriate somehow, or sometimes that's just what I'm feeling like, so there we go. And that will do it for this week's story session. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Come on back next week for a story titled Old Sultan. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Thank you.